Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on trauma-sensitive coaching and mentoring. We are going to give it about one more minute to start up as people come into the room. So welcome once again, and we'll start up in just a few seconds. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Trauma Sensitive Coaching and Mentoring. I am Nathan Four. I am the program officer for our college career and counseling initiative at IYI. It is a pleasure uh, to be with all of you today, Indiana youth workers across the state, committed to serving youths, forming a community of that youth support. It's an honor to serve and learn alongside all of you. The mission at IYI is to improve the lives of all Indiana children by strengthening and connecting the people, organizations, communities that are focused on kids and youth. And we do it for the kids. We do it to create change. We do it to be uh, on top of that change and to push workers. But we do it being together uh, in a collaborative, community of effort. We hope to empower our partners, empower our peers, um, all so we can uh, advocate for others and, and lift each other up. Um, a few uh, buttons to talk about before we begin. Um, for any technical support, please use the chat button. We have Erin Whitakum behind the scenes. She is our registration manager. She'll help with all tech issues. Also use the chat button to introduce yourselves, where you're from, uh, your position. Uh, the Q&A button we'll use for our question and answers. Uh, we'll do our best uh, to answer those questions throughout or at the end of the presentation, time consuming. Uh, it is important that later on today that you'll look for an email and it could be in your spam, uh, that email will have an evaluation. The evaluation is very critical for us to make sure we're providing the best content for our youth serving organizations um, to help guide our uh, content coming up in the future. Also, when you complete that evaluation, you'll be redirected for your certificate of participation. Like all IYI webinars, this webinar will be posted on our website so you can view it again or bring your partners along to view it. We'll also send out an email with all the resources and the presentation from today's webinar. It is a pleasure now for, for me to introduce our speaker, Lou Bergholtz. He's the founder of Edgework Consulting, a firm that's known around the world for its sports-based youth development, sport for development, and trauma-sensitive program design. Lou graduated from Cornell University with a degree in human development and family studies. Through Edgework, he has worked with firms on Wall Street, the organizations in Gaza. He believes in research driving practice, focusing on high impact behaviors. What people can do in their role or organization can have the greatest effect. We are excited and we look forward to today's presentation with Lou, so let's get started. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to spend some time with you all. Uh, I was just reading the chat and seeing everyone's introductions and sort of where they're from. Um, I'm going to jump in. We'll make the most of the time. Uh, we can keep the chat really lively. I'll try to stay connected to any questions that show up in chat or in the Q&A um, and try to answer them as I go or redirect to when we get to talk to those uh, questions also. Um, we're going to try to do a lot in the time that we have. You'll get all the content afterwards. So I'll try to build on it with some examples and stories and hopefully bring it to life in ways that are meaningful for you all. What I want to say up front about this is um, in my work and in Edgework's uh, um, the space we're in, we love this sort of sport for healing context, but more broadly, I'm an out-of-school time person. Um, I was originally trained as a nursery school teacher, uh, but uh, as the more I worked in schools, the more I was drawn to Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, camps, these places that sort of serve the, the out of school time experience. Sport is something that transcends both. There's school organized sports and then there's things that are in other um, parts of the community. Uh, but I believe in just good mediums for work with young people and that the therapeutic potential in a lot of things that we, we don't always see on first look as being maybe traditionally therapeutic actually is quite high. And I'm assuming for many of you that that's part of why you're here is to sort of expand that thinking. Um, and I've had the, the pleasure and the privilege to work with a lot of organizations around the world thinking about this intersection of 
the adversity, resilience, and trauma, especially in communities and places where there's just never gonna be that definitive access to, to all the care that someone could need. And so in the end, it's up to the people there who, um, who have skills, who have tools, who have experiences, and who know the context to be able to do the work that sort of builds programs and interactions that have the most healing potential. So um, with that, I'll uh, do my best to um, kind of frame up the, this idea of trauma and adversity, and we're going to jump into the, the skills and techniques in relation to sport. That being said, I really believe that a lot of what we'll look at today does not just apply to sports. So if you're here not representing you know, a formal sport team or organization, but are thinking about other aspects of work you do with young people at the individual level, at the group level, recreation, arts, music, like it all kind of intersects. And so I'll try to kind of bridge that as well, but hopefully you'll see some things that you can add to your, um, to your toolkit. So the way that we try to think about trauma is to kind of compare it and understand sort of the nuances between adversity and trauma. And so we think of that as hard things versus bad things. Um, hard things happen, right? Life is not easy. Uh, it, the history of the human condition is one of um, navigating hard things. And the, what's, what we call those hard things, we think of as adversity. Those hard things, when we experience something challenging, which could be traffic, it could be uh, not getting the grade we thought we'd get on a test, it could be a conflict with a coworker, um, it activates a coping system inside our body. And everything that you'll look at if you do any of your own kind of reading or research on, on trauma is you have to get inside the body to understand it. It is a, a biological experience. It's not just something we think of as emotional. And we have this wonderful coping system that's built to handle hard things, right? There's stimulus, which is anything out there that sort of we need to react to. Again, it might be uh, stepping out of the way of uh, someone riding their bike right in front of you. It might be someone shouting. We react, we cope, and we get back to normal. In that process, certain things happen in our body. Our heart rate kicks up, our body releases adrenaline and sometimes cortisol and endorphins, and we get a little bit more vigilant or less vigilant. Like all of that sort of supports a really strong response to hopefully sort of prepare you to handle the adversity. And it's a, it's a good system that we have. It's made to bend and react. And then eventually, as the hard thing goes away or we navigate it, come back to this sort of better place, right? a place where we're sort of more calm again, the stasis. Then there's bad things. Um, for us, the way we think about it, bad things are hard things that then overwhelm our coping system. Those can be acute sort of singular events. They can be chronic that build over time. They can be systemic that are there even before you're born and are pervasive in and around you. When hard things become bad things, our coping system gets compromised. It works really hard to help us get through, but when it can no longer meet the challenge because the challenge is too intense or the challenge doesn't go away, then our system gets compromised and we end up in this sort of narrow stimulus response cycle. And this is the case that happens to all of us, not just children, where we see for ourselves or for maybe the kid we're working with, sort of a large reaction to a small, what, se what seems like a small thing. And that reaction could be sort of amping up of an intensity and getting more aggressive and, and sort of reacting that way. It might be a, an amping down where they shut down and you're navigating sort of a disconnect in your own mind between this, I thought we were doing fine and now something really is not fine. There's a lot going on inside for that child. Uh, and what they're really wrestling with is sort of a compromised system that starts to get stuck in, that we, we don't get back to that stasis. And that might be because the situation is pervasive or it's in the home. It might be that it's such an intense situation that it, there's not a return because it, it, you keep revisiting it. It shows up in different ways. That's really what we think about as the distinction between adversity and trauma. That Adversity is the hard things, trauma is the bad things. And not all adversity becomes trauma. And all of us I'm sure can attest to many challenges we have faced that have actually 
improved situations in ourselves, helped us grow, helped us stretch. We need challenge to actually grow and, 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 and be better. But when there's a mark left behind, right? When there's an adaptability that we can't overcome, that's what we think of as trauma. So trauma is not defined as an event. So there's it's it's misused incredibly often in sort of the, the, the public spaces of this thing happened and it is traumatic. This thing happened and we'll see if there is a mark left behind. Many, many, many people um, have been through incredibly hard things and maybe they have symptoms of trauma for a while, but maybe they don't. Um, and so we wanna dis differentiate between the events and sort of what happens for a person afterwards. And Bruce Perry, who's a, a leader in this space, um, one of his lines I really like a lot is this idea that the state, this sort of amplified state that you get in becomes a trait. And what happens biologically is it gets wired in to your brain that a certain pathway that might be built for sort of a more calm, thoughtful, front brain reaction where all the good thinking is gets rewired for something much more reactive and sort of quick where, and this is how the brain works. The brain receives a stimulus. It feels first, right? Is this a threat or can I handle this? Then it acts, then it thinks. <laughs> Um, and in a, for a person who's been uh, affected by trauma, they're in this sort of feel, act, feel, act, feel, act state. And actually the thinking brain is not online the same way. It takes a, it's a much different journey to sort of get full problem solving capacity. Uh, and it's, it's hard. Like this is something that weighs on people. Uh, and I, I love collecting and thinking about um, sort of the metaphors that resonate for kids and that we can use to just like make sense of something big like trauma in a way that, uh, you know, we can again see it through the lens of a child. And some of the things I've heard that I really like um, is, you know, trauma is like carrying a heavy backpack around everywhere, all the time, in a chair, on the way to school, running, exercising, and maybe even sleeping with it. It's that rock in your shoe that just changes so many parts of you and actually might cause pain in other places after a while. For some kids and some people, it's like trying to get the thing you need, but feeling like no one can get close to you and that you don't deserve it. And Kenneth Fox calls it um, trying to play chess in a hurricane, uh, which I think has its own kind of power in the effort that goes in. And this is sort of a whole nother workshop we could look at and I hope you get to experience this in, in your professional development, but the idea that behavior tells a story that what you see in front of that young person, whether you know their story or not, and your mind is going, I don't get it. This, is, this reaction doesn't make any sense. Inside, they're probably trying so hard. Like the level of effort doesn't match what you see in front of you but appreciating that they might be playing chess in a hurricane inside um, can give us that sort of extra sense of, of empathy, sympathy, compassion that pulls us towards sort of maybe a slightly different approach. Again, so talking about challenging behavior lives inside everything that you do in work with young people. It's not the focus for today, but uh, it's, it's a good reminder sort of for some of the things you'll see in the skills and tools that we're going to look at. The healing pathway is, is wonderfully complex, not linear uh, or even sequential. But I think the thing I'll just sort of anchor on and we'll look at it through the sport lens now is that the beauty and the challenge of our brain is that it's pliable and it continues to adjust and adapt as we kind of live our lives um, and it can reorganize itself. So the bad news is it does get stuck in these ways where sort of trauma finds its way in. And the good news is that we can kind of un unstick it or find and create new pathways. It is not easy to do. And the elements of it are the things that you could imagine are important when you're working really hard. Daniel, Daniel Goleman, who's considered one of the sort of pioneers of emotional intelligence, he, in one of his books, talked about sort of cutting a new pathway in the brain is sort of like what happens to a water with rocks in a stream, is that sort of they all, it travels in a certain direction. And over time, that water can be redirected, but it's it's not gonna happen instantly, but what you need is structure, repetition, rhythm, support. Like all these things that we know are wonderfully essential in any good youth serving program. So the beauty I think of being more attuned to trauma and adversity is that it just makes for better youth work. Um, and what we tend to believe is that generally if you're applying a trauma sensitive approach 
to your kids. It doesn't matter whether you know their story or who has a diagnosis or who's been traumatized by X, Y, or Z. It's going to work for pretty much everyone. And so that is what I think of as real, the real power of adding the knowledge and as, as you'll see today, sort of some of the tools to your toolkit um, as well. So let me invite you, we can put this in chats if you're willing to. Uh, I want to be honest. I am not a sport zealot. Uh, I've come to appreciate its healing power and sport is, is a really complex milieu for kids and adults uh, around the world, but I think particularly in the US. So uh, let's just open it up on chat if you want to add like what makes your list of some of the ways that sport um, hurts, where sport does maybe more damage than harm. Um, you don't have to share you know, full stories, and uh, but think about your experience watching sport, participating in sport, um, and just seeing sport show up maybe in your community or in your programming. Where, when, and how um, does sport tend to hurt? And um, my guess is we'll have a nice long list that'll have lots of interesting kind of reactions and over uh, overlaps in terms of this because it, it's a it's a it's an important list. Um, I'm the father of a four year old and a one year old. I played soccer in college and uh, I coached my daughter's two year old soccer team last year and I had to turn it over to a new community where we moved to where they have a program and you know it is hard to watch someone else coach your kid knowing how complex sport is. Uh, and you can see in the list that's already been created how much is going on there and this sort of parent caregiver involvement as well. Um, there are like some structural elements to sport in the US that are particularly complex, which is you know fundamentally everything in youth sports tends to be modeled after pro sports. And it, it's just a different beast, right? Pro sports, they're paid, it's a job, it's a business. And we trickle that down and then we intersect that with you know, volunteer, mostly volunteer coaches. Um, as somebody said, parents maybe and coaches are reliving their unfulfilled sport experiences. There's just so much um, that goes on there that can be hard. And the data is, is intense on how many kids drop out of sports, especially girls in this kind of eight to 13 year old age range. Uh, when you know physical activity, physical health, competition, collaboration, like being able to be on a team, all of that is so protective. And so I'm going to try to make the case with some tools for how sport heals, but you have to honestly look at your sport and look at the things you can control and the places where you know you have impact and be able to to, to mitigate the the hurt element because. It exists. It's there. And I actually really believe we can do a lot of good with sport um, as well. I came into sort of the sport part, um, not necessarily reluctantly, but uh, a little kind of skeptically about where we could go with this. And I had this wild opportunity, and I'm happy to pull the research on this for you all as a follow on, to work with the Justice Resource Institutes in Boston. They, at the time, were sort of overseeing and managing six or more residential treatment programs for adolescent girls affected by complex trauma. And these were some of the most traumatized girls in the state uh, in you know, mostly semi-lockdown facilities, tremendous amounts of um, you know, isolation and violence. And they had built this sports league. Um, and they, every Tuesday night, year round, softball, basketball, flag football, soccer, handing these kids that most people in the state said, you know, shouldn't be given anything that they could hurt someone else with. There was like no touching allowed at some of these facilities, but giving them softball bats and soccer cleats. And every Tuesday night, there would just be this amazing setting and very, very, very few, if any, incidents. And so they came to us as program designers and said, all right, this is kind of cool. They're getting all these other treatments, group therapy and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and they're doing trauma-sensitive yoga maybe we're getting a therapeutic impact here, let's embed treatment inside of the sport. And so I got a chance to spend three years with them on that. And it, it just like pulled me deep, deep, deep into the clinical space and then back out to the sports space. And I kind of left that experience really excited um, about sport as a special medium. So let's look at why. Um, first of all, sport is pervasive, right? It's a global phenomenon. It's present, present 
in nearly every culture, nearly every geography. It's one of those things that tends to make these iconic photographs when uh, and something happens, uh, there's a terrible natural disaster, and then people start to rebuild. You'll see these kids playing sport on top of the rubble of what's left. Like sport emerges uh, quickly and it, it shows up in so many different parts of our experience in life, whether you play it actively or not. I also have come to really get excited about the fact that it, it has these inherent set of elements that are built to align with some of the core principles that are present in most sort of really good, well-documented, well-studied sort of therapeutic approaches as well. So let me show you those and think about your program and sports you like and play or are running and just see sort of how this lines up. Uh, so sport has at least nine elements. I'm like, I'll explain it to these briefly, but at least nine elements that tend to, um, again, align and sort of reinforce and support parts of what a, a good healing journey looks like for someone. And healing, you know, being defined in many ways, we think of it as, you know, the biggest daily stressors become more manageable. Your sense of self is stronger. You start to feel normal. So much of what happens for someone affected by trauma is they feel sort of out of, just out of society, that they can't contribute, that they don't fit, that they don't connect. Um, so, with that in mind, uh, I'll give you some definitions of kind of each of these. And, and, and again, think about sort of where this plays out in, in your work. Um, the first piece is home field advantage. And there actually is research that teams tend to win more games at home than away. Of course, every team or individual plays home and away. And so you, that's sort of how you, you know, it doesn't always play to the advantage of any one team over another, but when you have a home game, there's something different. And there's something so, I, I just love the idea of, that you can play a sport and know that you've got a home base and that when you're there, your people are there and there's more support. And it, it feels like an extension of something you know, in your life where you get to feel more protected and supported. Sport has seasons of play. And this is actually quite important. Um, trauma lingers, right? It gets stuck in. And part of what people describe in their experience with trauma is, you know, they're stuck in the past, they can't move forward, they can't let go. Almost every sport that I know of um, has a season, might have a competition at the end, a playoff, et cetera. But when you're done, you go away from it. And when you come back, you start with a clean record. You are no wins, no losses, no ties. You start with preseason that is full of hope and preparation. And every game starts, you know, most games and start zero zero. Um, and so you, you get to kind of revisit the restarting of things that is really, really hard for someone who is affected by trauma. There's so much that they carry with them. And so being able to come into a space and go, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to start is actually really important. Sport has a profound place for competence. So many of the therapeutic models from cognitive behavioral therapy to the ARC model um, has this sort of competence piece to it of getting better at something. Uh, and in sport, it's one of those places like my daughter in the last like two weeks has just figured out how to catch sort of a, a bigger ball. A and, you know, it, it like happened almost instantly. And in sport, you can find competency much quicker than you can in other parts of your life. And it's external competency. Someone else can see it. You could be wrestling with a math problem for hours and get it right. And nobody knows how hard you work because it all has to be in here. But in sport, people, friends, fans can see competence happen and celebrate it. And we need that if we're struggling. Sport has a physical component to it, which we know, um, like you know, the idea of sort of moving your body and being in control of it, uh, raising your heart rate, that bringing it back down is really important. There's a team and community focus that means so much to people that feel that they sort of don't fit in things. Sport tends to be immersive and engaging. And that's um, kind of the hook, I think, that people talk about a lot, which is, um, you know, people love to play sports. And once you have them, you can do other things. Uh, my experience is we should also keep rem rem remind ourselves that that's really important for someone who's suffering from trauma because their brain is all over the place. 
They're in the classroom, but they're looking at the door wondering what's the next bad thing that's going to come in. They're trying to focus here, but their, their, their thought, their feelings are over there. And many, many people who have, where sport has played a role in helping them get through childhood, adolescence, adversity, trauma, will say it was the one place where my head cleared. It was the one place where I didn't think about other things. Um, a lot of people exercise their way out of stress because between the physical activity and this immersive element of sort of having your whole body involved, um, it clears the head and it gives you a chance to have your brain remember what it's like when all the parts are working. Sport is organized and structured and we need that. Someone who has suffered from trauma has a sort of a, a disorganized sense of self. And so when there's a beginning and a middle and an end and a warm up and the halftime and all help someone make sense of their experience. Sport has so many pl places to make decisions. And I really think that what's great about sport is there's real stakes. Like most people tend to care. And so this idea of, you know, don't keep score, everybody wins. I think there's a time and a place for that. And this league that I worked in with, you know, some, again, some of the most traumatized girls in the state of Massachusetts, there was scorekeeping, there was playoffs, there was elimination from playoffs, and there was championships. And what I noticed was that, uh, and from my own personal experience, you know, you can go to an hour of therapy and try to work through a problem and role play it, and, um, but you're out of context. And you you do it a few times, but in sport you can you can work a skill, an emotional regulation skill, not just a sports skill, so many times in a game with support of peers and and coaches and ways to kind of come in and out. And so the real stakes piece I think ups the intensity, which is risky, um, but it also increases the potential for growth and healing as well. Um, so it's a lot to think about. These are not the skills, right? We, we'll talk about sort of coaching skills. I want to get to those in a minute, but um, I think you have to look at sport from the design side too, because if you're going to create a sport experience, whether it's just the, you know an hour of a sport that you organize with some kids or you're building a league or running a league, um, the design of the league, the focus on all the pieces makes such a huge difference in appreciating how special um, all of this can be and how much fun you could have with it as well. We used to run this workshop where we teach this and um, we would have, I think we were in Memphis. And uh, so we had um, one of the trainers come out wearing a Boston Celtics jersey um, and had the crowd sort of prompt to, you know, not cheer. And then we had one of the trainers come out, you know, wearing a Memphis Grizzlies journey, jersey and everybody went crazy. And we just talked about like, what's it like when you have home field advantage, when, you know, your people are everywhere, um, whatever your people are. And it, 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 it's, a, it's a metaphor, but also something you can take with you in life, right? Like, when do you not feel like you are at home in yourself? Where, what places give you physically, do you feel safe? How do you create home field advantage when you're nervous or starting to get anxious? Um, there's some, some really cool things you can do with all this. So uh, I'll leave that there. If any of these are particularly resonant, feel free to kind of share your reaction or commentary um, in chat. But what I want to talk about is, uh, for me, the, the most special part of, honestly, any activity, we're going to, again, have the sport lens, but is this idea that we think of at Edgework as the therapeutic core, that inside every activity is something that like, is inherently sort of built for um, healing. And I will, you know, this goes way beyond sport and, and, and in all the contexts I work in, I'm always like wondering and looking because it's right there. And sometimes we know it, sometimes people take these cores and like, and sort of turn them into something really big and intense, like trauma sensitive yoga. Many people have thought for many decades that yoga, you know, has a sort of, it's, its own inherent healing element. And then folks like Dave Emerson and other people sort of went there, right? They looked at it, they studied it, they deconstructed it, they rebuilt it with a, a trauma-informed lens. They wrote books on it, they researched it. And, you know, it's a practice now, like you can get certified as a trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive yoga instructor. Um, we've done this in elements of arts, in music. Uh, and that's great. I love when that happens. It sort of expands the ways that we can sort of promote healing, but it's our job in whatever capacity we have, even as a parent to a child or a caregiver to a child, 
to look at the activities that the kids like, because that's important, and the ones that you think are beneficial and just ask why, like what's in there that is good for them? Because they become powerful, powerful buffers uh, in, on this sort of healing journey. So in sport, let me offer you four, um, and you know, pieces of four because there's so many out there. Uh, the first is swimming. And think about this, like think about what we know and have talked about in terms of healing and the therapeutic aspects of what we're doing with our, our populations. And if you were to sort of invite a young person into one of these sports, focusing on the healing, not the hurt, what's built in there that's just good, right? So for swimming, first of all, it's a chance to leave one world and enter another, right? When you go into the water, you're literally sort of changing settings. It, when you're underwater, the noise is gone, right? All this stuff that is distracting and overstimulating and it also holds your body. And for many young people affected by trauma, like their body has become something that they don't like, that they hate, that may have been hurt. And so to be in a place where your body can be held lighter and held completely is very special. Floating in water has this sort of really profound experience for people. Swimming has like many sports has relays and sort of team events. And so there's this, you know, I'll do my part, you do your part, but we'll get there together. Volleyball. I love volleyball. During the 2012 Olympics in London, someone did a study of touching to see which sports had the most amounts of sort of positive touch during their play. And volleyball, I think basketball was number two, but volleyball, if you've ever watched a volleyball game, men's or women's, you'll see after every point, both teams get in a huddle and check in. And there's just tremendous amounts of interaction and positive touch. And for people affected by trauma, touch can be really hard. Um, and so finding a place where you can, and sport in general has this permission to touch where in so many other parts of our lives, it feels like you can't. Um, you can watch before a football game, you know, three, three boys, three men, who would otherwise not hold hands anywhere else in their life, grabbing hands with great emotion and walking towards the center um, to be able to do the coin toss. It's also a place where people are, you know, permission to cry. We're in so many other parts of life we can't. So, you know, so many feelings can come up in sport that in other places you can't even get to. Um, so sidebar, but it's just amazing what goes on inside all of this. Volleyball also has a specific role of someone who's called the setter, right? Whose entire job is to help you succeed, right? You get the ball to the setter and they try to give you something that is built for you, for you to score points. And that is an amazing role for that person to contribute, but to know that somebody on your team is there every point trying to help you. Uh, tennis has some amazing things. The thing that I love about tennis is that the coaches aren't there. Right? So many coaches are so close to the play that they actually interfere with ch child's development, I think, sometimes. Um, the coach has to be in the stands. That's that player out there making all the decisions themselves, making all the kind of choices about what they're going to do or not going to do. Um, tennis also has a fault when you serve. Like you automatically get a second try. So if you don't get the ball in first, you get to try again. And um, the pressure of getting it right the first time, of being perfect, of not failing, are things that sort of live inside many of us, whether there's trauma or not. And knowing that like you just get a second chance, think about how that changes your experience of that moment and of pressure. And then lastly is baseball. Um, and baseball is in a moment, right? So many things are changing in the game to for the fans, but there's some things built in there that I think are wonderfully kind of healing oriented. One is, think about it, you have a first base and a third base coach. So basically you do this really hard thing, which is to stand in a little box, have someone throw a ball at you aggressively and you swing and hit it. And if you get a chance to make contact with the ball, then as soon as you do, you've got a smart grown up standing there, cheering you on, telling you, helping you, looking out and saying, stay on first base. You can take a second base. Like, and you have the same thing on third base, like someone there 
whose job is to help you make the best decision under pressure. You know, to me, I wonder like, why not have a second base coach too, just to complete the loop? Uh, but it's amazing. And then there's this other thing that I just like obsess over in baseball, which this is what you see in the picture is the, um, the on deck circle. I don't know how much everyone knows about baseball or softball, but uh, in, on most fields, even in youth sports, there's an on deck circle where the player who's about to go up to bat goes to that spot and it's their place to get ready. And they can bring one bat or two bats. They can bring some chalk. They can bring some weights because they'll swing the bat a few times to sort of get their body used to, to get ready for a powerful swing. Um, they get ready. And no one's supposed to or allowed to go talk to them. It's this sort of sacred place that you get to go to get ready to do something challenging. And you know, I wish we could carry on deck circles everywhere we go before big meetings and because it's it's so special, um, the idea of taking that and sort of pulling it forward as well. So we can go on and on with so many sports. I hope you're thinking about maybe sports you like to watch or play and wondering what sort of is inside those sports as well. And let's put those in chat if you have anything. As you think about you know, sports and recreation, what are some of those natural therapeutic cores, right, that put people into some of a proactive, positive space that helps you see the world a little bit bigger, gives you more efficacy, pulls you forward, like mitigates reactions, lets you kind of calm down, brings people towards you. Um, like there's so many things that are sort of built into the therapeutic space for, for um, different sports. It's really, it's really kind of wonderful. So if you think of any, add them in, it'd be fun to see people's perspectives. I, I always love kind of cross-referencing the many, many, many sports that are played and how we see them. And just to come out of sport for a second, um, Think about, I go in a whole other direction, think about knitting. My mom runs these incredible, I would call them trauma sensitive knitting groups in the Cleveland area um, and knitting. Right? It's a group experience. You're, you're repeating and working on a skill. If you make a mistake, you can just take the yarn out and put it back in and start again. Um, you make something that often is warm and soft and comforting maybe for yourself, but also maybe you give it to someone and get to kind of contribute as well. It's remarkable. I spent many years working in the um, the, the, the illness community uh, around Paul Newman's organizations for camps for kids affected by um, illnesses. And it's amazing how many parents find their way to knitting because that's what he keeps them calm sitting in these hospitals all day and sort of waiting for bad news, hard news, no news. Um, there is a time and a place for all these things that have therapeutic cores. My daughter loves to mix potions with food coloring. And um, it's, uh, it's amazing what goes into that in terms of trying to solve a problem, thinking about kind of the patience of what goes into it, uh, the efficacy of mixing colors and starting again. Uh, and then when you're done, you dump it out and you start from scratch. Um, I don't, I'm looking at Andrew's comment. I don't have anything specific on Fear Star Wrestling, um, but, you know, just take, take the sport, right? And think about the physical design of it, of, of, the, of where the sport happens. Think about where the fans and the coaches interact and don't interact. Think about sort of the rituals and traditions that live in that sport of sort of what players do before or after a match, how the scores are kept, what you do in between breaks, like wrestling, um, most of the mixed martial arts, like you have a coach in your corner, like they're right there and you get these little breaks to go over and check in and go back out. It's almost like it's, you know, it's the coach on the shoulder, but who's not yelling in your ear when you're doing the thing, but is there when you have a, a chance to reset. It's like one of the most intimate, powerful moments to have the caring adult so close, but have time, right? You're not competing with the game to have time. You'll see, we'll talk about sort of breaks and timeouts in a moment. So what do you do with therapeutic cores? To me, the big thing is like know what it is and talk about how much you love it and what it does and why it is so special in the game. But from not necessarily from the healing perspective, but just that it's good for you as a player to get better in your sport. Coach to it, right? Like, and how players can use it and then connect the dots, right? Like remind them and talk about kind of where they, you know, where you gotta, in your life could you use your on deck circle? Um, what, what, would, what would it be like to give yourself a second try on something like in tennis uh, and appreciate that those connections can be quite meaningful, not just as metaphors, but as sort of tools to take with you as well. All right, so 
with all that, I want to use the time that we have left to look at a, a, a set of skills. There's many we can look at. I tried to pick um, a few that I think are, are really applicable to lots of sports and, and just have a lot of power in them. And I, my guess is some of these will resonate as overlapping with sort of more general youth, de youth development skills, but then some also, um, you'll see that kind of they're, they're built inside a sporting context. I'll start with a quick example. Um, if you were a coach and you were coaching basketball and you were having your kids dribble through some cones, so over to one cone and then cut left and over to one cone and cut right, back and forth, back and forth. And every time you're, the player dribbled to the right, the ball would go off their foot and go flying across the gym over and over again. Think about your approach. What would you do in that situation? Now take that same kid and they're waiting in line for their turn and they can't stand still and they keep pulling on the shirt of the kid in front of them or um, they can't stay on the line and they step out of line over and over again. What would be your reaction to them? In the trauma space, we think about this idea of skill versus will, that most people see the basketball part of that example as a skill issue. And when we see something as a skill issue, we bring coaching, teaching, support, patience. Most people see the kid not able to stand in line as a will issue. They should be able to do it and they can't, sorry, they aren't. And they don't teach, coach, or support. We often discipline, remind, dictate. In reality, for that child waiting in line, that may be the best they can do, that they are overstimulated by what's going on. They're distracted. They're trying, it's, it's the best they can to connect to the kid next to them. Um, but we don't coach or teach that. And what we want to remind ourselves is that like a lot of kids are working on those skills. And sport is a great place to work on them because there's an element of required sort of behavior that we can bend towards and then sort of elevate up to as well. And so, you know, the, the really master coach who brings this trauma-informed lens treats sort of everything as a chance to work on skills and just says, what if this is the skill the kid needs to work on? Yes, I can coach the basketball part, but what if waiting their turn in line is the skill? How do I build my practice for that? Because that is the life skill, right, in many ways. And that's part of the healing pathway too. So things we think about is like, always celebrate the attempts before people try, give them the extra love. Don't wait to see if they got it or not. Give people a chance, give kids a chance for rehearsal and preparation and sort of trying things on and break it into smaller steps. Like we know this about skill building, but we don't apply it to some of these sort of challenging behaviors. Make lots of chances for low pressure repetition of skills. Right? As opposed to everybody watching people and taking turns, like break into pairs and trios and let them work on stuff. And by the way, getting better at a sports skill becomes a regulating experience that might allow someone to, to work on other skills as well. So I'm not proposing we, we like differentiate sort of challenging behavior from sports skills, like let it all come together the way it does. Just make your habit do over second tries, third tries. Like why not? Right? There's so many parts of a, of a youth experience and program we, where we could say, yeah, you get three tries. Because not just because they want them, but because they need them, because it's hard to get it right the first time. Um, and yeah, in life, there's time to get things right. But in most youth programming, there's time to get better. That's what we're aiming for. And then put timeouts in the toolkit. Right? Like make it so that every kid, when they need it, could take that time out and it wouldn't be punitive. It wouldn't be embarrassing. We tried this at the sports league I referenced. Um, we, we gave unlimited timeouts to everyone in the basketball league. And we thought this, this could be a disaster. Kids are gonna call timeouts every two minutes, every time they, they're about to win a game or lose a game. But it, this is not professional sports. Like the, the kids wanna play. And so the timeouts were fewer in a way than when the coaches called them. And then the most amazing thing would happen. We would have kids call timeouts and the kids would come over with the coach and the coach would say, I got nothing. I didn't call timeout, what do you need? And the kid would say, it was just getting too hard. I needed to cool down. And the kids would go, we got you, we got you. They take their time out to just relax together and go back out and play. Like the trauma-sensitive lens 
on sports or changes so many of the ways we can think about it. And we keep the magic of sport and we actually bring it closer to not just what's good for healing, but what kids want. When we leave kids alone, they play more, right? When we bring in all of this structure, it becomes a lot of standing around. And so skill building happens from action. This builds on the one forward, take breaks, right? Healing work is inherently about trying to confront a challenge, when it gets too hard, coming back out of that challenge and knowing you could go back in, not feeling like you're in the challenge all the time. Some people call this like the window of tolerance. And you know, breaks are just natural resets. They're built for healing. And we need them. Heart rate goes up, got to practice bringing it down. Because for a young person affected by trauma, for anyone, the heart rate goes up and stays up. You take that pulse of someone who's really suffering, their resting pulse could be 5, 10, 15 beats higher than it's supposed to be or than yours is resting um, because that's how much the body has conditioned itself to be in that hypervigilant state, for example. And so knowing that you can amp up the physical movement and come back down. So more breaks are better. And then allowing kids to sort of step out of something when they need to, not we all stay in it together. And that's one of the principles that really differentiates, for example, trauma-sensitive yoga from regular yoga is that the, 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 the instruction in trauma-sensitive yoga is let's step into this pose, hold it as long as you can or want to. And if you need to step out, you can. And then go back in. Whereas traditional yoga would say, um, hold this pose for 20 seconds. I've, I've noticed, uh, uh, Melina, I really appreciate your question um, around bullying. Um, it's really hard. Uh, and this is where, from my perspective, you know, and this is not a critique of any one league, but, um, you know, most coaches that are coaching in, in youth sports in the U.S., you know, are under, if not minimally trained. They're volunteers, they're competing with lots of other schedules. Um, they're bringing a professional college coaching mindset and not a youth development mindset. Um, and uh, it's brutal. Like it's one of the hardest things I think about the, the sport context is it's sort of built for teasing, right? It's built for this sort of playful, I'll call it playful teasing, which really quickly lends itself to bullying. Um, and targeting individual kids, target and and sport puts kids on the spot to either succeed or fail in very public ways, um, and it's really hard. Um, and I think that's where uh, prioritizing, you know, team dynamics, thinking about you know that coach capacity, but then there's also like referees and their role, and that's a whole other piece. There's the you know the rules of the league. Um, and but my feeling has been, and I, I say this a lot, um, in a sports league, you're only as good, as safe, as trauma informed as your worst coach. Because you could be this amazing coach that builds this incredible trauma sensitive team and everything works in practice and training. And then you go up against a coach who's the opposite. And that game will become that kind of game. And then that coach will travel through every team and every team will have that experience. That's the level that you measure that experience. So, you know, elevating all coaches to that next level. Um, and some of it is just like understanding trauma, um, but it's it's hard. It's really hard because coaches have so much impact. And we, we, we elevate coaches in our communities as kind of untouchable in um, feedback and critique. And especially if they're volunteers, because I, I know you're volunteering. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And by the way, um, so it's it's really one of the more harder challenges I think to um, to address. Emily, I really appreciated that uh, that question, um, and I gave you a not complete answer, and I'm sorry for that because it's it's a longer conversation to have. Uh, just briefly, as, with the time we have left, I'll, I'll keep going on this here, and I'll keep looking for questions as well. Um, the breaks piece. There is you know, this construct in sport around interval training. And we worked with an organization in Afghanistan called Free to Run that does this incredible leadership development and sort of growth work with adolescent girls in Afghanistan, uh, training for half marathons. And if you, if you know anything about distance running, you don't 
you don't really ever run the full distance. If you're training for a marathon, you don't get out there and sort of push to a 26.2 mile run. You get to maybe a half marathon or a couple of long runs, but you do this sort of really thoughtful, intense, prepare, get in, do a very specific kind of training, get back out, rest, recover, take days off. That's the athlete's journey. And that's also part of the healing journey, if you think about sort of what breaks do as well. Um, and so it's important to look at your work, not just your sport, right? You could be doing art, you could be doing tutoring. Um, I worked on a project in Gaza, it was not sport. It was mostly after school academic support, but get in, try some things, get out, take a break. We know the breaks matter. People talk about brain breaks all the time, um, but in sport, they also matter as well. And sports built, with certain breaks in it, like halftime at soccer, but maybe 45 minutes of soccer is too much before. Maybe we should play it differently and it's okay to change the game. Um, that can be one of the best ways we sort of get a better outcome too. When in doubt, play catch. And I think this again applies to lots of contexts. It is one of the most regulating activities you can do. You find an object that you and the kid can catch pretty easily um, and you play catch, something wonderful happens. There is a reason why so many people say, oh, I remember playing catch here and doing catch there. Like it just connects. It creates a co-regulated experience. You find rhythm together. You feel competency. You can change and adjust the challenge so easily. It becomes informal and you can talk um, and it embeds inside everything. Like every, I think every sport, whether you have a ball or not, should play catch as part of the warm-up. And people do, like hockey, you pass the puck back and forth kind of lightly, lacrosse, you know, like you can do it without a ball. Um, the thing we think of is, you know, that catch experience creates like a little zone um, where you kind of get back in the zone, a place to sort of reconnect and recalibrate before you go back to play. We've really encouraged a lot of places now to try creating a little zone in your gym, for example. Like we did this with some of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada um, like a little space where you can put a ball or a frisbee or jump rope. And instead of leaving the gym or sitting on the bench when you're out of a game for a while is go over there and stay active and use that to recalibrate and bring someone with you. If you want to reset, uh, there's a, a lot of things you can do, um, that allow for resetting that are, you know, sport based, but can happen in lots of settings. The last two kind of are intertwined. Uh, and then we might have a few minutes for questions. Um, and uh, I call it coach the bench and praise the play. So in my observations of sport, and we have this sort of interesting role models of coaches that are just like shouting and yelling on the sidelines. And if you think about it from a trauma sensitive perspective, and you are a young person who's been affected by trauma and you're in this already kind of stimulating environment, let's say basketball, there's lots of voices that, you know, the, the gym is kind of echoey. You're probably already kind of, at the edge of your window of tolerance. And then you have this caring adult shouting at you from 20 feet away. And you probably can't hear all the words they're saying. So it's just a loud voice screaming at you. It doesn't really add to the experience. And it doesn't let that young person sort of make the choices and practice testing themselves. So we say, you know, think about flipping it. Where is someone more calm? Where are they likely to be observing the game? And and waiting for their chance, it's the bench. So great coaches coach the bench in general, but also in a trauma sensitive space, that should be your priority. Hey, you're going in next, let's talk. What are you gonna do? What do you think about? Um, what are you noticing? Uh, what role are we gonna play? What if something hard happens? You can be there for them, right? You can work through a reset. You can like talk strategy and planning and there's benches everywhere, right? Everywhere. In, most sports, there is a kind of bench. And if not, you can create one. And to me, that's always a good sign is when the coach is more interested in the bench than the game. The game is a chance for kids to work together and see how well they can do, not to be scripted or directed by an adult. It's really their chance to test themselves with real stakes. So we should get out of the way. So what do we do? At the, if we're not going to coach the play, we're going to coach the bench, then we should praise the play, right? Let them play. Um, and the big thing, honestly, because praise we think of as verbal, I think the most important thing we can do is just like check our body language and check our facial expressions. 
so that when they look at you, they see support, care, interest, right? There was a coach we, we met who said that he would be coaching his basketball team and they were a mess. Every time the game got more challenging, they would sort of fall apart and he would get more, do this, do that, do that. And after one of the games, he just threw up his hands and said, I don't know what to do. Give me some ideas. What, what do you need? And this one, you know, really um, brave player said, coach, man, could you just take a knee? <laughs> and his coach was like, oh, okay. And the next game, he took a knee. And because he's on his knee, like he couldn't move his body as much, and he just stopped talking. And lo and behold, these players started figuring out a few of these real issues that they were having with passing and coordination and everything else. You know, it doesn't solve everything, but you know, we don't need to be the center of the sport when it's happening. Our job is to like appreciate the magic of these kids testing themselves and challenge themselves in public often. And again, from the trauma sensitive level uh, and the trauma sensitive lens, this is like, this is the work. Like this is where they really can, can grow and, and face big challenges with medium stakes and this amazing caring adult on the side who when they come out of the game is there to talk about it once they calm down, to check in, to make sure they know that like when they go back in, we can work on stuff. So this sort of coach the bench, praise the play becomes this really fun um, kind of dual set of skills that can, uh, can challenge you um, to reimagine your role in, uh, in, in, in the play, in the run of play. The last thing I'll, just, I'll add in that this is its own workshop. So I'm gonna, gonna do, do the overview of it is that sport like has all this language that permeates society. I don't love using sport metaphors in my work with a non-sport audience because I think it is a turnoff, but in sport, the language is powerful. Like every, the way we coach and talk about sport, all that applies to life. So we worked with this, the boys and girls of Canada on this big um, resiliency league, kind of this trauma-informed sports league called the bounce back league. And we had these three skills, right? Come to play, build my team, play on. Those are all things that would roll off a coach's tongue in certain sports. And when you have that language and you, you like it and you know what it means for someone's development or healing, then you just have this like extra tool in your toolkit. You coach it the way you would in a game, but then maybe after the game or when a kid comes to you with a hard situation in life, you can reference that and it can, becomes meaningful and it becomes sticky. And so a funny but important example I'll give is we used come to play with another program in Namibia. And this was with sort of a, a growing women's soccer movement there. And this was the women's national team. We were training them in some, some skills, some youth development skills around coaching. Come to play was sort of one of the things we talked about a lot. Did you come to play today? Like, meaning, are you ready? Have you prepared? Are you making the, the, the time to sort of get ready for hard things? And then they all, they loved it. And they, that night they all went out for dinner or something and they all got dressed up because it was, a, you know, they were sweating all day and they were in the lobby of the, um, of the hotel and they were just like cheering each other on for sort of cleaning up and then um one of the captains said hey 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 i came to play tonight and forgive me if this offends anyone but she then like took out her purse and she had condoms in her purse and i am a former sex ed teacher in my another life like that's smart like that's what we teach kids right yeah, not kids but you know adolescents and grown-ups is like be prepared and so she was sort of making fun of it, but she also was like making a profound statement to her friends. Like, hey, I got you. Like, I am here to keep us safe. And she used the language to sort of reinforce that. And it made sense. And everybody sort of laughed and joked. Um, and they went out knowing that, you know, somebody had something safe they could use if they needed it. So again, I apologize if that offends anyone um, in terms of sort of sex education, but it's a great example of applying this to sport. With that, I will stop. <laughs> um, I've been tracking some of the um, chats. I appreciate the the warm regards and comments. I and welcome the chance to expand on this. We we do you know many many hour workshops on this and 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 programs. So happy to see if there's a way to be be useful with this in the future again too. If there's any questions people have that I missed, uh, please put them back in chat again. I'll try to scroll up, but I have a minute or two. Actually, I don't because I think there's a wrap up, right? So I'm gonna turn it back over <laughs> to Nathan. Thank you, Lou. Fantastic pre presentation. I think all of us who play sports, you know, resonated with why sports are so important to us. And you put context to what some of us feel and really give value to how important coaches are. So thank you so much.
Um, if, if, if someone doesn't sign up for a newsletter, please do so. A great content like this webinar and other webinars uh, you'll find in there, as well as Youth Worker Cafe information. So please sign up for our newsletter. Um, Lou, in the next one there. Yep, there you go. Uh, we have some upcoming topics that may be of interest. Uh, uh, youth issues from legislative session. We have uh, Stop the, the Trauma. Um, and then if you guys want to pin it, save the date. Our Kids Count Conference is November 14th and 15th. One of the best quality conferences for cost uh, you'll ever find. Uh, it's hosted by IYI, so please get that on your calendars. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, be a part of this topic. Good conversation. Um, please continue that feedback. Later, you'll get that email with the evaluation. Your notes in that, eva in, in that evaluation will definitely direct us for more content like this in the future. And you also get that certificate for participation. Thanks again for everybody. That concludes today's webinar. Uh, have a great day. Thank you all so much.